Welcome to part two of the episode of Unknowingly Connected with Dylan Newcomb. So if you listen, you've listened to part one, uh, where we talk about Dylan's background and what made him create Uzazu approach. In this episode, you will learn about specific of Uzazu, about states of course I've seen but modes basically how we can create awareness of what we do in our body and to create choice on how we can make it different. We also talk about how Uzazu embraced therapy and how you can see it on the self-assessment and what's next in Uzazu and Dylan's wish for the future. Enjoy. Over time, it, you know, it started as, as we discussed, it started with an investigation through the, through the portal of vowels into different states. Hmm. Then I and leading groups of people have really been exploring what are, how can we understand the vast sea of potential states and bring them down to, you know, sort of a workable set of, of core basic states, sort of like the primary colors of mm -hmm. states, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. um, and what are the underlying sort of core parameters or driving factors that make up this, the various states that we find ourselves in? Mm. Yeah. And what we've come to is that the first thing about our state is just really where, what is driving our state? Where is our attention? You know, they say energy follows attention. Mm. Energy and information follows attention, really, yeah. is the more yeah. complete energy and, and, and attention. Sorry, energy and information follows attention. So if I put my mind on myself, my mind, my awareness, if I use my mind to direct my awareness towards this here, mm. right, then, then that is what's starting to more and more conscious. It's already in the background, whether I'm aware of it or not. Of course, it's informing my state. But the moment I focus on my, my bleeding heart or, or, or my hungry belly or my, my desire to do X, Y, Z, then that, then that starts to grow. You know, we're watering that plant, right? Mm. So we have the states that are relatively more being sourced from self. Yeah. Yeah. And the states that are more in response to what we perceive consciously and unconsciously from others, others. in our environment. Mm. Right. And if you grew up in a household where, you know, you never knew when dad was going to explode, for example, you didn't have the luxury of just growing up focusing on yourself. You're like, oh, God, I'm in the kitchen and... You know, we're all on, on, on Hi glass glass here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, very, very hyper attentive to the world out here. Absolutely. Developmentally, at the cost of this, you don't get to practice that as much. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, there's an adaptation there, which was adaptive. Like we gotta, we gotta know where dad's at. Um, just to, <laughs> poor dad. I mean, dad's. Be <laughs> oh, mom. Um, oh, mom. <laughs> but it is a bit of a cultural trend. And, um, <laughs> Or we could have gone the other way. We could have like, gone, I'm not, I'm just not going to go to the kitchen. Mm. You know, I'm just not going to go down. So I'm going to stay in my room and I'm going to, I'm going to play my, my, my metal music or my, my artwork, or I'm going to meditate. Yeah. Right. And we adapt that way. Yeah. Um, you get the idea. The next factor is, is then now that we're perceiving something, we're attuned to a, a pool of energy and information. What, what do we do with it? Do we more, our sensory motor system kicks in in its various facets, right? Am I going to sense this and be in the experience of it and bring my mind into it to varying degrees of sense making? Hmm. Huh, feeling this, then reflecting on this. What is this? What, and I can do that more relationally. How do we feel? Like I was very empathic relational as a kid. So I was like, how do we feel? What is this relationship like? How are you liking me? How am I liking you? Why is it not working? And, or just into myself, right? And I can be more into my self action. So there's acting here, which is the motor, motor oriented and sensing. Hmm. So 
what do I want to do? Self-focused acting. What do I want to do? What am I focused on doing? Why am I doing it? Right. My self agency. Mm. Um, and this is also, by the way, the most, the polarity and, and the driver of states that is, that is from our research, the most influenced by gender. Yeah. That are, uh, whether you look through the lens of the research into uh, vocational interests and what types of facets of careers that women are attracted to and men are attracted to, um, 90% of women in the modern Western world, uh, this is triple confirmed research, are attracted to sensing and, and, and people focused helping and, and, and 10% here and vice versa. Hmm. I hate that fact. I hate having to say that that's what the research shows. And we still don't, the jury isn't out, of course, as to, to what degree that's just a feedback loop with culture reinforcing that. And to what degree is that just the nature of penises and vaginas and, and chromosomes and whatnot. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna respectfully take a step back from that debate. Yeah. Um, and, and humbly remain a student of, of that space. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, I don't orient that way. I, I'm much more a censor than an actor. I always have been. Um, but I can't, so I was very much against that whole thing, but I can't deny what m my own data of having analyzed over a thousand or 832 assessments statistically mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and having worked with hundreds of people, taught thousands, like, yeah, for whatever reasons. Anyway, so for women to feel safe and be nurtured and stepping into that empowered place of what do I feel and therefore what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and getting men to a place where they can honor their own feelings and the attunement with the other in a way that they don't have to sacrifice their own power and feeling mm -hmm. of empoweredness. Mm -hmm. it, that's a really functional way in my experience of understanding the sort of functional friction of the whole gender tension that, that is a huge part of what we're living through. Right? We, we have noticed in Uzazu research over the years, distinct general patterns uh, across men and women. Now, of course, general, right? There's always exceptions. And as I said, I myself am kind of don't fit that typical profile. Um, but it has been very helpful to identify these general patterns also to know, especially as a, as a clinician or as a coach or therapist, what to potentially look for, right? Because there are trends where you go, oh, there's that pattern again. And then you already have, you know, the, the ways that you know from experience tend to be effective or helpful, at least to try. Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually, and that said, I don't, I, uh, sorry, no, I don't no. like to fixate on gender that much. It's sort of like, to the degree that it's relevant, I'm, you know, it's absolutely powerful to, to lean into. Um, but I, I, as much as possible, I like to keep just coming back to what are the patterns in the body mind? How are they serving? How are they not serving? What's possible here? Yeah. And, and as I say, I think I mentioned it to you. Uh, some time ago is because of the type of clients I have, what I notice is there's a lot of overactivating, for instance, in the narrow posture, which is a lot of doing, like, you know, like overdoing, over working eventually, you know, like doing m more than needed or being like overly empathetic, overly attuned to people. That is where it's, that's what helped me with the self-assessment to recognize Mm, a tendency mm. and where we can work on and and maybe it it's manifest. helpful to frame for people um that within this model so this is the foundation for what's driving our states right so self-focused sensing self-focused action and then the relational half which is other focused sensing attunement connection and other focused action which is really then interaction of course which we call collaboration so inner experience our self-agency, our connection, and our collaboration or interaction is that in any of those fundamental states, we can, we can sort of be in a balance. We can do it in a balanced way, right? We can have a healthy, oh, that one doesn't work. <laughs> Let's see if I have a good green here. 
we can have a healthy amount. We, we code that with green, a healthy amount of activation of that state, but we can also overdo it, right? Like what you were just saying, I can, I can over connect. Like, how are you doing? You know, are you okay? Don't leave me, you know, all the different flavors of like, anxious attachment in essence, right? Mm. Um, we can be over self-assertive. Yeah, we can be like, I have to make this happen or, you know, being overly pushy or or narcissism can fall into this category as well. Just like over self-agency, we can obviously be over activated in our inner experience, our thoughts and our feelings and a little too intense to manage easily. Uh, we can we can be over collaborative and over engaged in the world and sort of get lost here and lose contact with ourselves. So we, in other words, we can go too far, and that's generally when 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 stress happens, when when it's not going well in an area, our first instinct is to is to turn up the gas, to turn up the heat, you know, to to our sympathetic nervous system kicks in and goes like, well, you got to do more, <laughs> more whatever it is. And then at a certain point, when, if that, if the situation is too intense, too extreme, and we're not able to cope, that's when we start to pull back. And we, then we do a 180 typically. And then we do what we call uh, under activation, which is a kind of a shutdown, right? Which is also parasympathetic activation. Um, so and this is also very much in alignment with polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges's work. Yeah. We just look at those features of sympathetic and parasympathetic balance and imbalance through this lens of these four interrelated yet distinct different sort of domains in which that overactivation and shutdown play out. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and also I was about to say the polyvagal theory, but also mm -hmm. the, what therapists call the window of tolerance, which, which right. would be like this dynamic so we don't have much time to talk about it, but it's basically yeah. that it's those as you frame is fairly related and 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 um, you can put it together and see what's happening in the body uh, through this the assessment itself. And right, exactly. Exactly. And I think it's maybe maybe interesting just to these are the, the sort of underactivated states we would put here. So like not ultimately functionally that our system is not then going far enough into that. Right? We start to numb our inner experience. I'm not going to feel my feelings because that's not safe. Or I'm not going to step into my power because shit happens when I step into my power that was not going well. Or, you know, the withdrawal avoidant. We go from anxious to avoidant. It's not safe to connect. It's not safe to interact. These are really like the it's not safe to. Yeah. Right. I can't. Whereas here the system's kind of saying I must. I have to. You know, if at first you do not succeed, try harder. Yeah. So, so I must and I can't. And this tends to, you see, higher energy level, as you said, lower energy level. Mm, yeah. Um, and the, the other thing that's worth noting, um, and I believe this is in a way one of the important contributions of Uzazu having an, a, a validated assessment and having had hundreds and hundreds of people take it, is we can confirm that it's, it's not either or. You can have a pattern. People can have a pattern of being underactivated when it comes to themselves, but really overactivated when it comes to others hmm. or vice versa. I could be totally shut down when it comes to interacting with others, but in myself, I get overly energized or it could be, uh, I overactivate in connection, but when it comes to interacting and being more proactive and assertive with others, I shut down. Like we see every combination under the sun. There's no general, oh, people tend to be like this. No, um, hmm. And so that's why it's so important to look contextually at people's states. Hmm. Well, how is it when you're alone? How is what happens when you're in intimate relationship? What happens at work? What happens here? And not to assume uh, that somebody's going to be showing up with very consistent states and imbalances in each area of their life. It's usually can be vastly different even. Yeah. So I think one example you mentioned is, for instance, when we connect with people is, uh, for instance, like how I connect with my partner versus how I connect with my mother-in-law or with my boss. It can be right. like slightly different depending on the context. Right? Yeah. And when my boss is a man versus when my boss is a woman or mm -hmm. you know, any number of things. Um, 
This is one of the reasons why we have come in in the in the working as a modality. Right? Like we're kind of talking right now about the model of states, but when, when we use Uzazu as a modality with clients, we tend to really work contextually, right? We, as you know, we we very much one of the one of the one of the major things we do in the initial stages sort of model the situation, right? So if somebody's saying, "Oh, when I'm with my partner, my intimate partner, I da 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 da," mm. so we will we might then take them into something called bridge posture, right? Where we go, okay, so imagine you're standing here, place your partner in your mind's eye there. Now just start to move forward, just that. Like what What do you notice as you start to move towards them, right? Then it's already, we're modeling a very simple situation, which is a very different context for self-inquiry than what do you think about your relationship right now? Or how's it going in your relationship? Now then we can, now we can see, Oh, well, what do you notice as you lean towards him? Mm. Now, soften down, because we know in Uzazu that as we soften our motor system and go down and, and invite the person to listen to their sensing, that they're going to get that much more information about what they're sensing, what they're feeling. So you're safe facing your partner and soften down as you stay focused on him. What's that like? Oh, da 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 da. Or, oh, that feels better. Or oh, that feels like I'm freaking out. Right? That gives us really important information. Not what just what they think about it, but of what's actually happening when they go to be more sensing in the context of connecting with that person. Yeah. Right. Mm -mm. And so then from noticing that from modeling. Oh, and then of course we go like, what happens if you lean forward? Oh, that feels better. Oh, that feels worse. What happens when you lean a bit back? And then we can really gain a much more functional, we were talking about that before, a functional understanding of how their state is happening, not just how they feel. Absolutely. Yeah. So it actually, it makes me think of the model itself, you know, when we talk about body-mind and sometimes we talk about models which are bottom-up. So first sensing and see what comes up from the body, like what yeah. thought comes up or what sentences comes up from yeah. a certain posture but it can be the opposite. Like, what do you think? And then move from the posture itself. So what I'm saying by that is like the modality of Uzazu can be as powerful for embodiment practitioners mm -hmm. as from coaches, we usually would have the narrative of the client and then mm -hmm. they can transition into posture to have a more um, a contextual and yet somatic uh, response yes. to what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And I think a good example of that, of how like one of the ways in Uzazu, we, we play with, utilize uh, the mind-body connection and, and relationally embodied uh, posture with uh, sentences, with thoughts mm -hmm. forms is, for example, there's a, the difference between, we might say with this person, okay, now that you're here, just listen to how it feels as you soften down and focus on him. And just say, I want you to, and then finish that sentence just intuitively. Mm -hmm. I want you to, so we're doing something kind of top down to start it, but then leaving an open space for that to collide with the body and, and then I might say, you know, and just be curious, say it, you know, say three or four things, let three or four things come out. Don't overthink it. Just allow yourself to be surprised. Right. And then it might be like, I, I want you to honor me more. Or I want you to, you know, take out the garbage when I ask you to, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I want you to really see me and we can be surprised by these things, right? Because they're coming from a more connected and contextually plugged in place yeah. on the other hand we could do something like we've over the years we've mm, developed uh, sort of example statements that are both sets of them that are indicative of imbalance sort of an on the nose expression of imbalance like uh i'm really worried you'll leave me somebody might not be allowing themselves to think it but to model that lean a little bit forward and just say i'm really worried you'll leave me that might, whoa, open up a realization because shit, that's actually true. 
<laughs> I didn't let myself think it, but it's true. Or it's like, mm, no, no, that I don't feel that. Right. Well, now we know. Great. Right. So it's a, a more honest assessment. And of course, we can do the positive ones. Right. Um, I'm enjoying connecting with you or I'm enjoying being with you. And then they can sort of use that as an assessment. Oh, yeah, I am. Or uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm lying when I say that. Hmm. Right. And we do so we do that a lot. Say this. Hmm, what was it like to say that? Yeah. Let's, let's learn. Yeah. And, and the last thing I wanted to say about sentences is regarding like underactivated or balanced or overactivated um, modes is it's really many times when I hear clients say I can't or mostly when it, it's usually like underactivated or when you say like I have to or I must yeah, you really like have a sense or I should you have a sense like there's an overactivation that exactly. them so you, the you learn to hear it in their language in other words yeah yeah yeah. And to see it in their body language. It's, How it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, there's something I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. And so one of the things that has emerged in terms of just how we work with sentences is you can use them. Uh, it's it's. It's a known thing in our culture to in personal development space since decades now, especially from Louise Hay popularized them affirmations. Yeah. yeah like. I'm, I'm beautiful and abundant or, you know, whatever it is. And then we say it and we say it and, and it has been shown that it, that it can have positive results. It's also been shown that it can have negative results. If it's done in a more disembodied way, A, we can kind of should on ourselves. Right, where we, it can actually promote this subtle disassociation, this kind of mind over body where it's like, you're gonna, kind of like when your parents or your school teachers would tell you not only what you're gonna do, but how you should feel about it. And we're kind of doing that then to ourself because so-and-so said, I should feel this way. Yeah. Um, and then the body can rebel. So anyway, we work, I invite people to first use them as provocations. Mm. Just say it and then be curious how your body responds. And then, then, then we start to lean in together to, you know, what can we do with that? What's, Absolutely. what's the beginning of a conversation with your body as, as it were. Yeah. So, so to give an example is if we do a balance, we'll try to do a balanced posture and state, I can, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. If, if there's um, a tension in the body, we can say like, it's, it's, it's not, the client is not there yet. And then we can work on how to how to reach <laughs> this possibility to make an affirmation of I can. Right. And and sense it at the same time that the person exactly. is saying it. And that might involve sticking with the words and trying different variations of words. And of course, it might involve forgetting words for 10, 15, 20 minutes mm-hmm. and just really working with breath, maybe some imagery, sensation, maybe different postures that can move the energy in different ways. Right, then coming back to it, feeling it, then maybe trying that statement again, seeing, oh, does, does that feel different? Mm-hmm. Right, so um, it's a, there's so much goodness in my experience to having, having a balanced range of tools mm-hmm. and, and sort of sub-modalities like, oh, let's work with imagery, let's just work with breath, let's work just with the body posture, let's bring in these sentences, and then developing your sensitivity to when to use which yeah. why in the flow absolutely mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. i have a i have just a few more minutes actually okay. if, if we want to cover one more thing yeah so well basically my next step would be considering that as you said uzazu is um an dynamic modality let's say that it's it mm-hmm. kind of evolving so what are you next step what are you working on what is the evolution of Uzazi? Oh, oh in this sense yeah i thought you meant dynamic as it pertains to the client experience oh which, no sorry about which also Uzazu is, but, itself yeah 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 um well the so uh, as i kind of alluded to i think the the embodied intelligence you know basic self-assessment has been about 15 years in the making, and we just got a round of data analysis and validation. Um, And it scored uh, 0.934, I believe, in Cronbox Alpha, which is very high reliability. But there were still six of those 72 items that were performing 
just a bit subpar. It's still, the whole is an accurate thing, but so I'm really looking forward to <laughs> trying variations of those assessments, of those assessment items. Um, we're gonna be running towards the end of the year, a really large study, hopefully, and, uh, and you and I have to talk about this too, um, <laughs> is comparing it with other assessments. So comparing it with the Myers-Briggs, comparing it with the big five, comparing it with more specific assessments of self-esteem, of self-efficacy, of attachment styles. Mm -hmm. um, this has been built in, in close interaction and awareness of many other models. Um, I'm a, a, quite a quite a geek when it comes to that. I spend a lot of my time in in the in that world. But we haven't yet statistically studied, you know, like I know just from clinical experience the relationship of bound attachment styles to to the under and overactivated states here in other focus sensing. But I I really want to have, you know, a hundred people take the uh, experiences in close relationships assessment, the validated, you know, leading assessment of attachment styles and take this one and also work with some of those people and have a video of that. So we can also see those attachment mm -hmm. styles and uh, really come to life. Yeah. And, yeah. It, for me, in terms of the long view of grounding embodied understanding of how we're functioning and, and really objectively validated and subjectively effective tools is these these things of integrating it with with other leading models that are validated in in education in school systems in businesses uh, I, I believe that the assessment is a key piece in integrating embodiment more formally into the systems of our culture so yeah. that's a key commitment and and thing of Uzazu yeah, so actually, many times when I have not only clients, but just people in general um, who are curious about embodiment, and, and it's it's really tricky word because it can easily go into the woo-woo land for some people. Like, do you think woo-woo land in a sense? Yeah, like, just you know, feel if you, it in the, 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 Yeah, the. so if you go to... Because... Um, I started with embodiment like other modalities and uh, and when I've been in companies, it's not easy to say, okay, do a posture, <laughs> you know, to a manager, but the self-assessment is really something more tangible and you can explain rationally to a client the why and how and, and, yes. and the reason why we're doing that and how it shows up even in an assessment, which is something really tangible that many people have done. You know, like right. personality stats and so on. And, and the other thing that's unique about this is that in, in contrast to most or many to most personality assessments is this is measuring the frequency with which you're in, you're experiencing these different balanced and imbalanced states in, a, in that given period in your life, in a period of generally, you know, two to four or five weeks. Hmm. And the assumption is if you're doing some serious personal development and we would recommend Uzazu, but you really you can respond to any modality you're doing. There's tons of great ones out there. Mm -hmm. um, this will measure those changes over time. So now you have a, a, an embodiment friendly tool that understands, you know, that is modeled after how we physiologically function that can track your progress or, or your disbalances, because this is not just responding to skill and capacity. It's part skill and capacity, and it's part a measure of, of the stresses in your life at that moment. Yeah. Right. Because mm -hmm. I saw when people's assessments, when the pandemic hit, I saw more imbalances. It's not that they were going down in their personal development. They just had a tougher time. And mm. that, of course, is reflected here, too. Yeah. And so it becomes a very dynamic tool that it, that remains useful individually and very much in your relationship with clients over time. Mm. And, and I think it's a good way to test also. I mean, to many of to many clients, I usually say, like, test and see it by yourself. It's not like, don't trust me that it's going to work. It's, it's a really good tool to see for the client to see if they practice the evolution and the progress they're making. That is not right. only subjective, but you have, you have a tool for that. Right. The, these questions are about your life and about your experience. And they're a great way to zoom out after having done, you know, some, some work, some of which would have been clear to you why you're doing it, but some of which are like, I hope this is going to help. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you get to zoom out and go, Okay, let's see. Is it making a difference in my life? 
is it actually making a difference? Mm-mm. Instead of like, oh, I paid $500. Um, they were in 10 sessions, I'm sure. I hope it made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but you asked, the question was, uh, where's Zuzazu going? So this is one part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other part is we are really, uh, Deb Grant, my co-trainer, um, who's a clinical social worker and, 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 and psychotherapist, We've been, last year we did our first 10 month certification, like a full length certification for coaches and therapists. This year we're doing the second version of that. Next February, March, we'll start the third one. And it's just so rewarding and delightful to take coaches and therapists through a training of this. And also it, it, I learn and develop Usazu quicker through that interface of seeing what works, you know, which I've, yeah, it, it really matures Uzazu more quickly to have also so many feedback loops in place with our students and their clients so we can really see oh, what's working, what's not working. Yeah, certainly. Or not, um, not, but, you know, how can we continue to make this that much more efficient, effective, user-friendly, all that stuff? I just... <laughs> I'll never stop trying to improve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Dylan, I have a small uh, video to share with you, a small surprise. So, okay. Um, let's see if you recall this person. <laughs> okay. I have no idea. What... Hi, this is Martha Eddy. And, Dylan, I was asked by Stephanie to say some words to you which is so much fun because we really haven't met except maybe glimpsing each other in a large uh, Zoom room when many other people are on the screen. Um, And yet I've always felt a connection to you. Um, I've talked to a few people and heard that you have a dance background. So we seem to have that in common as a route for quite depthful somatic work that we do. And I want to celebrate all that you've created. And I just think it's synchronistic that both of us liked the term dynamic embodiment and also wonderfully gracious of you to recognize that I've been you know, running a program that's called dynamic embodiment for many years. And it is a type of somatic movement therapy, which I'm sure you may relate to as well. Um, maybe you call it coaching, maybe it's exploration, but certainly we're both helping people Um, tune into their bodies and understand how movement can access different parts of who we are and get us to where we want to go. So wishing you all the best, looking forward to hearing more of your podcasts and seeing what you and Stephanie work on and just um, having a good time. All the best, Martha. (laughs) Oh, makes me a bit emotional. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> what? How did how did that ha- happen? Happen? Oh, magic! <laughs> so Martha is, um, as some people may know, um, a really, really big somatic practitioner. She's been um, on the board as president of Ismeta for quite a few years, and uh, yeah, she just wanted to say hi. <laughs> Lovely. You know, I'm going to be in New York City for next week. Just I'm going to dip. I'm, I'm in Connecticut on semi vacation, but I might dip into New York once or twice. And as I was watching that, I was like, I should look her up and see if we could actually meet. Absolutely. Yeah. I, she's she's on my short list of people to like, connect with directly. So I think this is the straw that I don't want to say broke her camel's back, but um, I think we have to connect. It's time. <laughs> I'm honored that she that she did that. And thank you. For, that's so lovely. It is so important, I think, for uh, just for for people who are sort of you know pushing the edges of somatic practice to be in a, appreciative shared inquiry together. It, it's just so enriching for the field and. Mm-hmm. So thank you for making your own contribution to perhaps helping that happen. You're Lovely. Welcome. That's part yeah. of the podcast. <laughs> well, <thank> you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so there's one question I usually ask um, 
people on this podcast is if you can have one wish, what would that be? It's a big question. <laughs> is, it, is that within a certain context or just like? Just like with Uzazu and... and oh, with Uzazu. And with Uzazu or just in general in life. It's up to you. <laughs> I leave it open. <laughs> I could wish in so many different directions. Um, I'll tune into this moment with you and, and our listenership here. Being embedded as we are in modern and in our case, Western culture, but really in, in, in the developed world and, and to some degree, the whole world, I would assume, we have this notion as modern people who have learned to read and write that we can think about things, analyze things and make good decisions. We might not feel that we're personally that good at it, but we know that it's a thing that that people do and that you know, we want to study and get better at so we can think, analyze, make good decisions and take actions. And that's just culturally assumed. What is not culturally assumed is that we can have reliable, effective, deeply beneficial ways at our disposal that are not all that difficult at the end of the day. Sometimes they're uncomfortable, but they're not all that difficult of in very precise, skillful ways feeling into our own energy, emotion, state, and working with it to shift it into the state that will most serve us to do what we're wanting and needing to do at that moment, mm -hmm. right? And in the process to actually have that, that deeper skill to suss out what is just sort of more coming from my mind and my ego in terms of my desires and my impulses and what verses and what will really serve where I'm at and that which I care for, my values, that I wish that and part of my, you know, I guess a way of talking about my core mission with this lifelong project here and the Uzaza community increasingly is to be one that Uzazu can 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 make a significant contribute contribution to culture moving forward that that becomes more and more also an assumption. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can feel it. That people are just knowing that. Walk, you know, growing up knowing that. Oh, mm -hmm. wait a minute. Let me let me feel into my state and shift it so that I have a better foundation to do whatever I'm going to do. Mm. In, which is a more bottom up balancing thing, right? Right now it's very top down. Analyze, predict, and then control. Control my body, control the world from here. Mm. It isn't serving humanity all that well. Mm. Depression, anxiety, the more complex the world gets, the more the mind goes, eh, and the more we're like, eh. you know? And then technology is forcing us to be even more outside our bodies here instead of in the world sensually. Right? Like, I, I love my laptop, but it's not so sensual. I don't, like, get down with it with my body. I don't, I'm not in a, a tantric relationship with my laptop. I wish I could be, but I'm not. You know, so how can we help culture to reclaim the intelligence of the body and integrate it in our ongoing cultural evolution so that it is a, a, a potent thread in that alchemical ongoing cultural evolution? Because right now it's a bit on the side, going along for the ride, going, oh, I'm not feeling so great. Oh, shut up, you'll be fine. Read another blog article, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's my wish. That's my wish. Oh, lovely. Dear. Embodiment, more and more an inherent element of culture. Hmm. And by the way, it's just, it just last uh, sentence because it, it reminds me that more and more nowadays we talk about intuition maybe because of what happened recently uh, it's very trendy to talk about intuition or gut feeling um but as we say it's the gut it comes from bottom up <laughs> it's not like a mind process so um, from our gut from our cells from our you know 
from our proprioceptive, you know, Golgi receptors, from from so many aspects of our embodied being, yeah. all has a, a, a song to sing. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dylan. It has been a pleasure to to talk to you and uh, looking Likewise, forward to seeing you very soon. <laughs> yes, lovely. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, have this conversation and to share about this with uh, whoever hears it. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. As you know, I take time to create all the podcast episodes that, of course, you can listen, but you can also watch as video where we include slides to explain theory, names we're mentioning, and so on, to be able to understand better what the guest is talking about and for you to be able to to learn so if you can't subscribe as there would be more episodes to come and and share share the knowledge and as you know it's all connected and we might not even know it see you soon <laughs>